this morning we are transitioning really out of the Reformation time period. Typically the Reformation time period, basically the 16th century, 1500s, uh, from the early 1500s with Luther all the way to the end. We have, we'll, we've seen how it's developed. We've seen Lutheranism, Zwinglianism, Calvinism, all the other isms. We've seen how France and Spain and England and Germany and Austria and Sweden and Denmark and everybody gets involved in it and there's the continuing challenge with um, the interplay of politics and religion. Two, com two combinations of things that you really don't like to, to intermix. And what we're going to see is as we transition into the 1600s or the 17th century, um, this morning, what we're, we're going to be looking at, there's, you know, in Gonzalez's book, there's two chapters, chapter 14 and 15. Um, <clears throat> it's called The Age of Dogma and Doubt and then The Thirty Years' War. As much as I hate to say it, this lesson is one of those things that, that basically is something that should act as a warning to us today about how we interact with one another, how we interact in the world, and I think it, it's even telling uh, across um, religious lines, if you will, even how things are being affected in Islam today because of these very things. So I'm going to go through the material, but what I really want to spend as, as much time as we can on is the impact and the ramifications and the application. Because again, church history isn't just about, okay, here's what happened. It's here's the effect of what happened, whether good or bad. And what we're going to see today in this particular time period is a real change to what we would consider the modern world, uh, Europe, uh, change in thinking in particular, and as it affects um, um, Christianity. Uh, and it doesn't matter what form. It doesn't matter what ism you, you come from. There is a form that is significantly affected by all these different kinds of things. So we have to be very careful as we, we look at the, the lessons this morning and learn them. So forgive me for, for doing that, but don't want that silly thing to pick up on the recording. <clears throat> Electronics, good stuff, bad stuff. All right, with that said, the Thirty Years' War, I've joked about this during during several lessons, at least it wasn't the Thirty Years' War. We're, I'm going to give you a very short synopsis of when we look at the Thirty Years' War this morning. There's so much more that goes on to it, and as a military historian, I also am quite fascinated by the war itself for a lot of other reasons, but we're going to look at it in particular of how it affects people in their thinking and why it affects people in their thinking. The, um, the things that we're going to also see is... The idea of faith is going to be questioned by the end of this. How in the world could we believe such things if this is the result? And this, is, this is where we're, our lesson is going to come in. And what people are going to turn to, and we're going to see in our coming um, lessons, is to reason into quote-unquote natural religion. Natural religion is what we would basically go back to uh, and call paganism or our modern environmentalist movements and things like that, natural religion, worship of nature, and things like that. We're going to see all of these things and these movements begin in the change of thinking. And like I've told, I've, 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 I tell people in the hermeneutics class and here, it's whatever your presupposition that you begin with, most people are very logical to follow it to a conclusion. If you begin to doubt what you believe to be true, what happens? You either double down and just hold your breath, right? Or what? You leave it. You go searching for something else. If you say, I question this, there's nothing wrong with questioning things, right? It's good to question, ask questions so you don't get locked in like we've already seen. The whole Reformation was a good thing because it, questions were asked. But if you get too questioning and you've lost your faith in something, 
you get problems, and that's what we're going to see. So let's begin with the seeds of war, because this is like anything. Any eventual outcome is preceded by something that's, you know, the seeds are planted, it gets watered, and it starts growing, and then it bears fruit. And the Thirty Years' War is, bearing, is the fruit bearing of the seeds that were planted. And the Thirty Year War itself becomes a seed that's planted that's going to bear fruit into the future. So it's kind of interesting, like we said. React, uh, reaction and reaction. Well, when we get to the end of the 16th century or the end of the 1500s, we end up with Rudolf II, not of the reindeer type, but Rudolf II was uh, emperor in Germany. And he wasn't particularly trusted by his subjects, nor was he a particularly good ruler. So that's already telling you something. I don't trust the guy, and he's not very good at it anyway. Uh, he had been educated in Spain, okay? So if you think the Germans have this guy educated in Spain, and who was he educated under? He was under, educated under the Society of Jesus or the Jesuits, okay? And those were the shock troops. Those were the counter-reformation folks for the Catholic Church. So he's already in a bad situation with his local folks. So you can understand why he probably is not well trusted and then his competence isn't real high to start with uh, on top of that, if you will. So at the beginning of the 17th century in 1606 in, uh, I think it's Donauwerth, Germany, um, riots begin. And this is this because the city the city had adopted to become Protestant. Remember, and these are the days when we want to be Protestant. Okay, everybody here, you're Protestant. Really? I'm Protestant? Well, yeah, the city just declared itself Protestant. So if you're Catholic and you're going, yeah, but I didn't decide to be Protestant, you're kind of out of luck. Um, what ends up happening here is... Uh, this borders a staunchly Catholic region of Bavaria. So your neighbors are staunchly Catholic and you decide to become Protestant, which doesn't mean everybody in the city is going to be Protestant. Uh, so they basically come to this um, conclusion that, all right, Catholics, you can stay here in the city. You can exercise your faith, but there's a restriction only within the confines of the local monastery. So that basically says all those Catholic churches out there, nope, but if you want to be a Catholic, go to the monastery, be Catholic. You know, in those days, that was fairly reasonable. Uh, to us, that would be like, you've got to be kidding me. But in those days, if you've got princes and rulers and people deciding the city's this or the city's that, because guess what's going to happen? What do you think is going to happen to this city? Well, they could be divided. We know there's going to be a riot. There's a lot of Catholics close by. There's a lot of Catholics close by. So who, whether you're Catholic or whether you're Protestant is going to be based on what? Whose army is stronger? Whose army is stronger? Yeah, exactly. Who wins the battle? Congratulations, we're now Catholic again because this is what we're going to find out. And this, this type of behavior is going to be just endemic in the entire Thirty Years' War type of thing. So the, um, the Catholic, those who remain in, the, in there were supposed to stay in the monastery, but eventually some local monks go, you know what, we're sick and tired of this. We're going to do our Catholic thing outside the monastery. And they're met with friends with rocks and clubs. Hmm, how well do you think that's going to go? Great brotherly love, right? Let's start throwing rocks and clubs. All right, this isn't starting off very well. So eventually, this precipitates Duke's, Duke Maximilian of Bavaria. Okay, he's a he's a, a German guy. He says, you know, I'm going to stamp out Protestantism in that city. So in 1607, he sends his army to the city and forces everybody. He wins because he sends an army and forces everybody to become Catholic. So that's pretty cool, right? Hi, we're Protestant. No, you're not. You're Catholic. All right, we're Catholic. Anybody would like that kind of life? I mean, it would be like an election here. 
you know, you take the army out and say, okay, this, this commissioner in this city now says that everybody has to dress in green and next time they go, everybody's got to dress in red. But this is about your faith, what you are allowed to believe or not. Now, we, we might kind of laugh at that right now, but as our society is going, that might not be too far-fetched. So just understand believers have lived under this kind of behavior before. Unfortunately, this also ends up in a war, which is not something that you want to see. So in 1608, the Protestants say, hey, we don't like that. So we're going to form the Evangelical Union, to which the Catholics the following year in 1609 band together and form the Catholic League. Now, this means you have two organized factions which are going to eventually become warring factions organized together, the Evangelical Union and the Catholic League. And these are going to be the things that are going to be set up with princes and rulers and all throughout all of Europe. And people are going to pick sides and armies are going to be raised and wars are going to be fought for 30 years. Okay, we're almost to 2017. That means the wars that we're going to look at started in 1986 or 87 and finished this year. Think about that. That's a long, long time to be at constant war. So you can imagine the ramifications that's going to have. So these guys form these leagues and... Um, Bohemia, if you remember, was the uh, area of where John Huss was from. We remember we talked about John Huss and the Hussites, and they were basically Protestants to begin with, even before Luther and these other folks. Um, there was din discontent in those areas, and now you have a ruler who's ruler over Bavaria, Ferdinand, who happens to be staunchly Catholic. Um, not a good thing. So, even as a Catholic ruler, there were people who would say, well, okay, if he's a good ruler, we're okay with it, right? It's like you, you know, don't care for this guy theologically, but he's a good ruler, okay. Well, he wasn't a particularly good ruler on top of it. If you notice here, guys, a lot of times people will put up with a belief system with a bad ruler or a ignore the belief system with a good ruler. But if you have a belief system you disagree with and a ruler you disagree with, that's when you get into trouble. And we're going to see that kind of a thing. Have you ever noticed that in life? I don't agree with that person, but they're a decent guy type of thing. Or I do agree with them. Oh, yeah, they did some bad stuff, but I'll overlook it. People are very good at that. Well, here he was neither. So Bohemia, already Protestant, already has a long tradition they're starting to get a little bit upset. And so uh, they don't like it when the king uh, doesn't listen to them by some stuff that's put forward by the royal council in Prague. So they revolt. Not a good thing, but they did it. And they actually, this was a humorous thing, sort of. They actually threw two of the king's advisors out a window, but they landed in a pile of garbage, so which broke their fall in May 1618, so it was merely a, uh, um, a slight to their pride. You know, it probably wasn't too good. Some rulers of the, you know, the, the king's advisors are usually dressed nicely. You can see these fancy guys tossed out a window, and, you know, they were intended to kill them, but they landed in a pile of garbage, which, all, which I'm just looking at and going, let's see, there was a pile of garbage big enough outside a window where royal and governmental people met that they landed in the pile of garbage. Talk about city sanitation. <laughs> I'm like, really? <laughs> so just little things like that, you kind of go, eh, maybe we don't have it so bad after a while. This, the streets weren't quite swept. <laughs> this was big enough pile of garbage that you could throw two guys out the window and break their fall. So that tells you a little bit about... Uh, Prague during that particular time. And by the way, that's how all major cities were like. So sanitation is a rather t relatively modern thing. 
So this is known as the Defenstration of Prague, 1618. This basically begins the Thirty Years' War. All right? And it's broken down into four sections, the Bohemian Revolt, the Danish Intervention, the Swedish Intervention, and the French Intervention. And it runs till 1648. If you really think about it, that is equivalent of uh, a whole generation plus in those days. Um, you know, once you got past, you know, in your 20s and 30s, you typically lived into your 50s, sometimes 60s. But a lot of people, you know, half the population died before they were age five. Now, what do you think is going to happen when you have continuous war for 30 years, given that the outside the royal quarters you can have a pile of garbage big enough to break two men's falls? Things aren't going to look so good. And it's really hard for us to even contemplate what it would be like to be at war in your country for 30 years. And there was no grain reserves and stuff that you could go pull back on. If your crops failed, you died. If the army came tromping across your fields, too bad. And you can imagine if people in your family were killed and, you know, you'd get pretty upset about it. Okay, yeah, I'm going to go to war. But eventually, after 30 years of that, what do you think is going to happen to your attitude towards a lot of stuff? Very cynical, yeah, and that's what we're going to see. So let's give you some highlights of the Thirty Years' War. You can already tell it's going to be really pleasant, and uh, as like I said, the, the Germans joked in World War I, at least it's not the Thirty Years' War. Well, fundamentally, more people died and there was more devastation in Europe in the Thirty Years' War than anything prior to or afterwards up until you get to World War I. And the only reason World War I had more killing is because of modern mechanism, you know, machinery against ancient tactics and bad medicine. Okay? I mean, Europe lost a generation. Basically, that's what you're going to see here. A loss of a generation plus in the Thirty Years' War. So, after this defenstration of um, Prague, you end up with Bohemia is going to brace uh, for a counterattack. So they ally themselves with Frederick, the Elector of Palatinate, and he was primarily in from a reformed area, so he was a logical ally. And then the, the um, rebellion spreads to Cilicia and Moravia, which basically is uh, modern day, if you look at Germany and Poland, and the Czech Republic and Slovenia, it's kind of down in the Czech Republic or what used to be Czechoslovakia, kind of in the middle Czech Republic. Uh, so it's a little bit south at north of Austria. You got Bohemia, you got uh, a whole bunch of other areas right in that. So think of southern Germany, southern, southwestern Poland, southeastern Germany, uh, Czech Republic area. So it spreads into that area. This is also, remember, we talked about the Moravians. Mm -hmm. Moravians are from this particular area. These were, the, these were some of those who eventually had the, the rebellions and then end up with the Mennonites, like Minos, uh, Simon Minos, who's actually from the Holland, Netherland area. So all these, that's this particular region we're talking about. So it starts there. And so Ferdinand II, who's the emperor, um, calls out Maximilian, who is over Bavaria, and the Catholic League to subdue the revolt. And they were very successful, and they force Frederick to be deposed, removes him as authority over his hereditary lands. The Protestants, of course, now are under a lot of persecution because they were sort of in charge. Now they've been beaten, so now they're under persecution. So in Easter, 1626, so if you notice, we've moved from 1618 to 1626, so we're beginning into the Danish intervention time period, that was decreed that anyone in Bohemia who did not convert to Catholicism was required to leave the country. With that degree, decree, plus the war that had been fought up to that point, Bohemia had only 20% of its population of 1618. And this is 1626. 80% of the people either dead or gone 
because they had to leave the country. And of course, where are you going to pick up? Just move to the big city and go to the factory. Uh, they didn't have any of that stuff then. You're out of luck. All right. So this is just the beginning of how ugly it gets. Now, uh, because Bohemia got beaten, other European powers, we're not worried about church stuff, other European powers are being very concerned about the Habsburgs. Because if they can beat Bohemia and do that to them, what's going on with the rest of us? So it's kind of like the big bad wolf. <laughs> it's got too much power. So England, the Netherlands, and Denmark in 1625 uh, add their support to the Protestant League or the, you know, the uh, Evangelical Union, if you will. And they offer to invade and restore Frederick to his rightful seat. By the way, Frederick is son of James I of England. What is, who is James I of England famous for? King James Bible. 1611. Okay. So he is, uh, he's the son-in-law of James I. Um, now we move to Ferdinand, of course, wants to have all of the forces under his control. So he uh, puts this guy named Albert of Wallenstein uh, in power. Now, let me tell you something about Wallenstein because history knows him as Wallenstein. They don't know him as Albert. You just say Wallenstein even though he was of Wallenstein. Wallenstein, what everybody recognizes him. This dude was a brilliant military commander. The only guy that could, could match him was Gustavus Adolphus, which we're going to talk about in a second. But the guy, talk about a mercenary. This dude wanted money and power. That's what he cared about. If you give him money and power, he'd fight for you. If he give him money and power, he'd have peace with you. If, that's what the guy was about. But he was incredibly talented military commander. So that's not a really good combination to have an incredibly talented military commander who wants wealth and power. Well, Ferdinand knew that. So we're going to see how Wallenstein uh, is treated. Now, he ends up um, fighting against Christian IV of Denmark. Remember, we had the Christian II, and then we had Christian III. This is Christian IV, there's, though there's a small break in here between the, the namings of Christians. And he was of Denmark. He invades Germany, with two, but he's got to fight two armies because he's got Wallenstein and these other people. And he wasn't particularly successful, and he leads to the Treaty of Lübeck. And the only thing that does is make things better, Right. No, it just trashes more people, more lives, more countryside, resolves nothing. So just think about it. Well, we're going to come here to help you guys. And all that ends up happening is your house, your home, your church, your city, your fields get trashed. And when we're all done, we're right back where we started from. Anybody want to be part of the 30 Years War yet? Let's go back to the 1600s. Yay! Right? You wonder, you, you wonder what was happening in 1620 in Massachusetts. <laughs> the pilgrims, you know, they got out of there. So if you notice, this 30 years war started in 1618. They went to Plymouth, even though they weren't supposed to be in Plymouth. They were supposed to go to the south. 1620. So this is when all that stuff is happening. So all of that early American history, you know, the colonization and all, that's happening during the 30 years war. So you understand there was some really good incentive to get out of Europe at this particular time. So that brings us to Gustavus Adolphus. Now this guy is, again, I'm not going to go to the gory details of the military. I studied this guy from a military history perspective and brilliant, brilliant commander. Um, he rises to power in Sweden in 1611. Again, there's you know, good old King James Bible date. Um, and he was only 17. Now think about this. A 17-year-old becomes the king and because of his skills and personality unites Sweden and throws off the rule of Denmark. Because again, we remember Denmark and Sweden, they were trading back and forth back earlier. Well, he eventually throws Denmark's rule completely off. Uh, other European rulers don't like the Habsburg strength like we saw. Um, 
Gustavus was also a very strong Lutheran. If you remember, we talked about that Lutheranism grew very strong and became the dominant uh, group in Sweden. Very strong Lutheran. So after he sees all the stuff that's going on and happening, he decides to say, hey, I'm going to help out the Germans. Well, um, in between this time, by the way, Ferdinand disbands Wallenstein's army. And because he's a great military commander and all he's interested in is money and power, that's a pretty smart move. But Gustavus wanders into Germany and says, hey, I'm going to help. But, now watch this, Gustavus Adolphus, besides being a very good military commander, he wins some battles. But then he is kind and tolerant in Germany, even of the Catholic rulers. It's like, look, I don't agree with you, but, you know, you can believe what you want to believe, but let's stop these other guys. Now think about that. Very, very strong Lutheran, very devout Lutheran. But the Catholic rulers realized that he was a better guy to be allied with than it was to be allied with Ferdinand and having Wallenstein come in and pound on him because of the guy's kindness and his tolerance. Not tolerance of, okay, anything goes, but tolerance is, I understand what you believe, I don't agree with it, but you're citizens of this region. So that kind of a attitude made a massive difference because what did Christian IV come in? <laughs> he just came in and trounced things up. Nobody liked him. Adolphus, Gustavus Adolphus, comes in in a much different manner. So he starts gaining allies. He starts gaining support, even from those who disagree with him theologically. Now, that's a lesson that a lot of us can learn because there's lots of people all over the world that may not agree with you, but you can still learn how to get along. Be kind, all right? Now, he's not going to get to be kind to everybody. Remember, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. doesn't always depend on him. So guess what he becomes? Really good general. Um, so in France... You, you have, you know, of course, the French are involved in the middle of this, is you have the France being effectively ruled by the Catholic Cardinal Richelieu. Anybody know of a, an author in some series of books that are associated with Cardinal Richelieu? The Three Musketeers. Oh, come on. Three Musketeers. Cardinal Richelieu was involved in that. So this, that's the setting. So Cardinal Richelieu was there and the Three Musketeers... And, uh, so, you you end up with uh, you end up with these guys, uh, Richelieu saying, "Okay, well, how can I get back at oh, Spain and the Habsburgs?" Right? He he's a Catholic cardinal, but what does he end up doing? He allies himself against Ferdinand and Wallenstein and these guys. So you're going, wonder what Richelieu's really about. He's not so much worrying about his religious stuff anymore. Now, of course, he'll turn back and forth because that's Richelieu. But he is a guy who allies himself with this league to fight Ferdinand. Because, again, it's France and Spain against each other. So he uh, continues with this. And Adolphus, uh, Gustavus, says, Okay, we'll let you help us as long as not one speck of Germany becomes France or becomes French. And so Adolphus continues to do uh, well. The, he, his power continues to grow. The Catholic League tries to get him trapped into a siege at Magdeburg, which is a famous massacre because Adolphus does not do that. The League destroys the city and massacres the people. Now, how popular do you think these guys are after they wipe out an entire city? Not real happy. So they try to then attack Adolphus at Leipzig, and they are totally destroyed. So again, Adolphus, the tremendous military commander. Uh, his allies continue to win parts of uh, Germany and Bohemia, and the League that's now defeated sues for peace. Um, they restore Frederick to his rightful power. They agree to expel the Jesuits from the empire. Okay, what does that tell you? How successful were the Jesuits? 
quite. Remember we talked about the Counter-Reformation and the Society of Jesus and Jesuits, and they were very militaristic. They could get in there. They were evangelistic from a Catholic perspective. And they, they were very effective in the empire. And one of the things, one of the terms of the conditions was get rid of those guys. Make them leave. You can feel to be Catholic, but get rid of the Jesuits because they would have been the most difficult people to deal with theologically as well as organizationally because they were very effective at what they did. This is making sense seeing how what things that people thought were important. Now you got political things, you've got legal things, and you have religious things all mixed together. So this is this is the advantage that the, that uh, Adolphus brings to them. Um, what else? Now because Ferdinand II is not able to get power back any other way, he recalls Wallenstein. And what does he promise him? Great wealth. Wallenstein goes, eh, okay, that's enough. So he comes out of retirement, if you will, and successfully takes back Prague. All right? Again, the guy's a brilliant military commander. Uh, he marches and faces off with Adolphus near Lutzen and is soundly defeated. Which you're like, whoa, wait a second, somebody beat Wallenstein head on. But Gustavus Adolphus is killed in the battle. So he wins, but he gets killed. And that basically is going to throw Sweden into disarray. So we come to the end of the Swedish period of the Thirty Years' War. And... Um, Sweden wanted peace. Wallenstein would negotiate with anybody who would offer him wealth or power. If you notice why Ferdinand didn't like to keep this guy in the field long. And uh, eventually Wallenstein and his officers are murdered. And I can't remember who had him murdered, but it could have been Ferdinand. It could have been somebody else. Could have been, we just don't like this guy. Kill him, right? Um, because if you have a great military commander, the last thing you want is a great military commander who can be bought right? Not a good thing. So he and his, his uh, guys are, are killed. And um, in 1635, that kind of ends that Swedish phase. And now France, working with Sweden, takes up the fight of the Thirty Years' War until 1648. So we're in 1635 to 1648, 13 more years of fighting. And this really is just a fraction of what goes on in the Thirty Years' War. The Ottoman Turks were even involved early on. So you, from a European perspective, this is like World War I. I mean, you had pretty much everybody in Europe at war with each other that it had any significant power. All right, I'm tired of explaining it, and I didn't really explain it. How tired do you think people would be of living it? Not particularly happy with any of this. Now, if you're sitting here going, you know, am I Catholic? Am I Protestant? Is communion given in two kinds? Is it transubstantiation, memorial? And you've been running for your life and your family's life for 30 years. Are you worrying about great theological differences between people or are you beginning to go eh, I'm not so sure about this well the results of all this stuff is people begin to question if this is Christianity and the varying forms and all why should I believe any of this after 30 years of this nastiness now remember Everybody's wrapping this in form of religious righteousness, right? Even though 90% of it has nothing to do with religious anything. It has to do with power politics of the European stage. But the moment you wrap it in righteousness, guess what's going to happen? Guess who takes the blame? The, the church does. Not the politicians who use it. The church does. The politicians got away with all of it because everybody goes, they're politicians. They're kings. 
The people who come out looking bad in this is the church of all flavors and varieties. The French, the English, the Germans, from a nation state perspective, their rulers come out looking really good. More and more power. And what do you think their issues are gonna end up being? What are they gonna be paying most attention to? Their power, their autonomy. Their power, yeah, their autonomy. Religion, eh. We'll use it when it's to our advantage. And we're going to see, this isn't instantaneous. This again, these, this, the seeds were planted to get to the 30 years war. The 30 year war now plants the seeds for a whole bunch of change that's going to follow on. The logical things that are going to come out of it. And as a result of the 30 years, uh, of the, all this fighting, the French decide that, you know, it's time to take the lead as a world power and let's step forward and propose peace treaty with everybody. And they do, and it's called the Peace of Westphalia. And this is established in 1648. And all of the kindness and religious tolerance and all that stuff had absolutely nothing to do with religious tolerance whatsoever. It basically said, you know, let's just leave things alone. Let's put them back the way they were. Let's stop fighting. And they basically said the buildings, the holdings, all returned to the status they held in 1624. And there's a general amnesty granted to all those who rebelled against their rulers, except those who rebelled in the hereditary lands of the Habsburgs. Okay? So if you were part of the hereditary lands of the Habsburgs and you rebelled, they could do with you whatever they wanted. Anybody else? All is forgiven. Not forgotten, but forgiven. 30 years accomplished nothing except destroying most of Europe, in particularly Germany, because that's where most of the battles were fought, Germany, France, etc. There were battles elsewhere, but that's where the dominant stuff happened. So what you see here is after all of that, again, wrapped in righteousness, you end up with pretty much nothing except a very disillusioned bunch of people. That plants a lot of seeds for the future. So let's talk a few minutes about that. We've got a couple of minutes here. Let's talk about the indirect results. Well, a little more quick change artistry for failure to delete things from a disk. It's quite amazing uh, when you forget to do stuff like that. So do, let's now look at some of the uh, indirect results uh, of the Thirty Years' War and some of the things that are going to come out of it. We, we've talked about the Peace of Westphalia, and it really is sort of the, a peace that um, is trying to end just the most brutal fighting that, I mean, honestly, Europe had seen up to that time period. And the result of this peace and the things that are happening out of it aren't... Uh, toleration for the sake of, hey, we're all getting along theologically. It's more toleration of, I am sick and tired of fighting. People are like, all right, it is not worth fighting over these things. These are just not places where we want to have any war. 30 years of having your countries just shattered, your young people killed, your economy ruined, your towns burned, your fields, your crop. I mean, it's, it's a horrible situation. And so people become kind of disenchanted. They become actually disillusioned with the faith of any kind. They're going, well, if you're a Catholic, that didn't do you any good. Well, if you're a Lutheran, that didn't do you any good. If you're a Calvinist, that didn't do you any good. If you're Anabaptist, that didn't do you any good. Zwinglian didn't do you any good. So was anything really profitable that came out of this? A matter of fact, is this theology stuff really correct even. So how could you talk about love and caring for one another and helping one another and your theology, all you good theologians, create this sense of catastrophe? Now, to be fair, it wasn't the theologians creating the catastrophe. The theologians were saying, hey, this is what we want to worship, and it was 
people in power, whether they be theological power or secular power. And remember, the secular state and the churches are fighting with each other. And we've seen politics, power, religion, all intermixed. So it's simplistic to say that it was a religious issue, but if you want to blame somebody, who's it easy to blame? You don't blame the king because they have the power to cut your head off. You don't blame your ruler, even though you might. What you're going to do is you're going to blame the theologians, and which is what happens with many people. Matter of fact, many rulers. A lot of the rulers are kind of going, I don't really care about this religious stuff anymore, particularly. I can use it when I need to, but I'm not really going to um, uh, care about it that much. Now, there are some that do care about things from a religious perspective, but most of them are just going, hey, I've got power now. I don't have to worry about these church folks anymore. I don't have to worry about the Pope anymore. And these are the things we're going to see development at, that comes out of the Thirty Years' War and all of the horrors that are put forth. So what would you think might be the things people turn to instead of a religious view of life? Because again, you know, it's not, it doesn't seem to be producing too much. I mean, these are things that we, we hear today. Uh, what, what are some of the things that people might um, turn to? Yeah, reason. You know, the humanistic idea. And we're going to see that these thoughts and ideas start developing. So, reason. Okay, man can reason it out. We can figure it out. The age of reason, which is what's going to be coming. What else? What other things might? Religion. Well, yeah, religion. But what kind of religion? There's, there's other, uh, other faiths. Well, yeah, Buddhism and things like that haven't, haven't shown up in Europe or things like that. But what other religions have been hanging about, who have been there? Think about what Rome used to be. Yeah, the paganism or the natural religion. And so a lot of people start turning to either uh, reason, okay, here's, here's how I can think it all through, or they turn over and start looking at, you know, the earth and the sky and, you know, all these things and turning back to a lot of the pagan religions, you know, the, the Druids and Celtic things and, you know, all, all the stuff that, that, that people uh, used to look at. And later on, we're going to see that you kind of get that nature movement. And aren't we seeing the same type of ideas even today? Well, religions dead, but I've got this spiritual idea and it's nature worship or it's we can think it through and we have scientifically can solve the problems. We still have these things today. There are different forms and different morphings of them, but faith, which looks like it produced all these wars and bloodshed and hatred, is now being blamed and people turn to reason and natural religion. And so these are some of the indirect results of this 30 years war uh, and all of the horror that came about it. It, it propagates itself in, in, in Europe and it spreads to the U.S. and around the world through European expansion and other things like that. We're the inheritors of it all. And we're going to see as we progress further in church history, we're going to see this is going to develop theologic movements, this is going to de develop interpretive movements, it's going to uh, change a lot of the way people see church or are involved in church because of these very things that we've just discussed.